Back in the early days of computing, the logic that runs computers was hidden away and sold only to those that had enough money. This kind of works if you have a business use case for every computer, but it rightly pissed off a large number of computer programmers just wanting to understand, modify, or reuse some locked away secret program. Richard Stallman was known for fighting against software patents, and in 1985 started the GNU project by releasing his call to action. Now with a fearless leader chosen, we the people started work towards rewriting what was largely inaccessible to the general public. While applications make up a large amount of what computers can do, it gets nowhere without a kernel. At the end of the day, the kernel is exposing hardware to the software. This lets software developers target kernels instead of individual hardware platforms. While the Freedom Respecting OS called GNU started developing its own kernel in 1990, shortly after, Linus Torvald started developing his own OS called Freaks, which then was renamed to Linux. Linux and GNU merged forces once Linux took on the GPL license in 1992. Anyway, let's take a look at where this all started to come together. H.J. Liu's bootable root disk for Linux is widely considered the first distribution. This puppy was built for an i386 computer with a 5.2 inch floppy drive. I don't own any hardware that can run this, but we can emulate this with PCEM. Okay, PCEM is not that good at reading floppies. Did you know that DOSBox is an i386 emulator? I wonder if we can get this to handle Linux. Oh wow, Lilo. I didn't expect that. This brings me back to the days when Slides 10 was still supported and I worked for Novell doing SUSE Linux technical support. I think Grub is a lot easier to work with, although I only got a handful of calls with people using Lilo. So it seems DOSBox does not like booting Linux. I'm not sure how motivated those devs were when it came to hard drive controllers. But it's cool to see the different error messages from the very old versions of Linux to the still very old versions of Linux. I'm not sure why I didn't try QEMU first, but this has been installed on my system for a long time. QEMU had no issue running at all once I figured out this command. This early operating system looks a lot like the modern operating system that powers most of the internet. Pretty cool for the earliest thing that you can call a distro. On login, you're greeted with an ASCII Bart Simpson. This was distributed on floppies as a bootable root disk. You could install it to a hard drive, but that was targeted towards the more technically minded. This early version of Linux is a cool sandbox you can play around in. It's interesting to see how many of the core ideas are already in place. Slash bin has a bunch of binary programs. These are all command line based. Slash Etsy is full of system settings like FSTAP, which contains a list of disks that need to be mounted on boot. Etsy issue seems to be the closest thing to a release file that I'm going to find. Slash dev looks very similar to how it does today. Except the device names aren't as dynamic. They seem to show placeholders that don't point at real hardware. A lot of the block devices don't actually seem to be real devices. I'm not sure why I'm using TTY0 and TTY1, but you can see that computer magic here is working. You can even take notes with VI, just like a lot of modern Linux users do today. Some commands don't work 100% the way I expected them to. Tab autocomplete is not implemented in this shell, which does slow things down quite a bit. Wow, proc is empty. Switching over to a newer version of this project, we can see there are more of the files we'd expect to see in slash proc. The kernel's virtual memory map, kcore, is rather small. I think that's around 64 megabytes in total. This newer version also includes a few more programs and a few fragmented help pages. Shutdown didn't act quite as I was expecting, leaving me with this message. All in all, it's very interesting to see where this minimalistic OS started. The tools included are rather limited, but it seems the only way to install additional software back in 1992 was to copy source files and build it yourself. The important takeaway here is this was the first freedom respecting operating system made by people for people. Thanks for watching. Bye.